Hi everybody and welcome to this talk on designing your own wellness plan. My name is Natasha and I currently work as a paediatric SHO in London. My special interests are doctors, mental health and well-being and I um, blog about issues relating to those issues. So if you want to check out my work you can go to my website www.thewelldoctor.org and I'm also on social media on Instagram and Twitter at the well underscore doctor if you want to learn more about me. So today we're covering the topic of wellness plans. We're going to be talking about what wellness plans are, why somebody might need one, and how you can design your own. But before we do that, we need to briefly talk about what wellness is. So for many of us, when we think about wellness, we are primed to think about specific images. For example, we might think about healthy eating, about yoga, physical forms of self-care like pampering, meditation, spending time with friends, and spending time in the great outdoors. And one of the reasons why we are so primed to think about these images is partly because these are really popular and really valued forms of self-care in our society at the moment. And these wellness activities really work for a lot of people. But the problem is that sometimes people can feel alienated from the concept of wellness when these types of wellness activities don't work for them. So you can come to the conclusion that if these wellness activities don't work for you, then maybe wellness doesn't work for you. And that's definitely not true because everybody has a different idea about what wellness is and someone else's idea of wellness might look more like this. It might include baking, lots of yummy treats, more aggressive types of sports, more active things instead of relaxing, partying, reading alone as a form of uh, recharging your batteries instead of socializing, or spending time at indoor events instead of in the gray outdoors. And that is the thing about wellness. It is completely individual and different things will work for different people. In fact, if we look at a definition of wellness, like the Global Institute of Wellness definition, it is the active pursuit of activities, choices, and lifestyles that lead to a state of holistic health. And of course, this is different for everybody. So now that we've addressed that, we can talk a bit about wellness plans. And this is where actually a wellness plan can be a really good thing because it addresses the individuality of wellness. Um, what it is in essence is a reflective tool that allows us to plan ahead for our wellness, to monitor that wellness, and to create tools to fall back on when we are not feeling so well. So right about now, you might be thinking to yourself, well, I'm pretty well right now, and I think I know what keeps me well, and I know when I'm not well, and I know what I'm like when I'm not well. And that is great if that is you, because it means that you're already ahead of the curve, because the truth is that for most of us, it is rare that we stop and reflect on wellness itself and what keeps us well. Um, until we actually have something happen that requires us to look at that and analyze it. This is no less true for doctors who can often be extremely busy, um, highly motivated, ambitious, career-driven people. Um, and we often have to juggle quite a lot in our lives, as everybody else does. We have work, we've got our personal lives and relationships, our ambitions. Unfortunately, what happens is that when things are not going so well, oftentimes the first thing that people sacrifice is actually any types of activities that contribute to their wellness. And this is because we often perceive them to be less productive or less useful. Unfortunately, this kind of thinking can often lead to burnout and to mental health issues, um, as can not preempting this kind of behavior. And this is definitely what happened in my case. So when I was a new um, foundation year two in 2017, 
um, I was in a very unsupportive workplace, um, which is actually a really common occurrence, I think. Um, I had no senior support overnight. I was often left to deal with emergencies on my own. My closest registrar lived an hour away and that experience taught me a lot. It made me step up to the level of being a registrar quite early on in life. And actually I saved a few lives in the process of doing that. But unfortunately the trauma of that experience combined with uh, some difficulties in the relationships I had at the time, uh, as well as poor uh, health of some of my family members, um, just became the straw that broke the camel's back. And I ended up taking six months out of training um, to deal with burnout and severe anxiety and depression. And it was actually around about that time that I started thinking about wellness. And this was born out of my desire to want a way to stay well. I started reflecting a lot on what wellness was, uh, how could I be well, what kept me well. And I wanted a way to recognize when I was less well um, and to know what made me feel that way. And I also wanted to be able to find a way to communicate my needs to other people so that I could get the help I needed to support myself to stay well. And these are actually all the different components of a wellness plan, though at that point in time, I actually had no idea what a wellness plan was, and I had never heard of it before. Um, but these are often the components that are included. In fact, in some cases, um, wellness plans have been trademarked. Um, so for example, there is uh, RAP, that's the Wellness Recovery Action Plan, and that was devi devised by uh, Mary Ellen Copeland. So uh, she is an author and an educator and a mental health advocate who actually had loads of problems with her mental health herself. Um, and in 1997, she went to a summit in Vermont with a couple dozen other healthcare users, um, and they wanted to find ways to think about and to support their own wellness. And um, that was really the beginning of when she started thinking about this RAP framework. And um, eventually, in time, she set up the Copeland Center for Wellness and Recovery and she devised this framework. And a lot of the questions that I had for myself when I was unwell were actually things that they reflected on and uh, that were eventually included in the plan. In fact, some uh, NHS trusts have uh, gone on to use this framework. So the Mental Health Trust of Barnet Enfield and also the Cheshire and Wirral Partnership. Um, and they call their plans slightly different things. I think Cheshire and Wirral calls it the Wellness Recovery Action Plan, which is the original name. And Barnet Enfield uh, calls it My Wellbeing Plan, which are both um, different types of plans that you can find on the internet if you're interested. If you want to know more about RAP itself, you can head to wellnessrecoveryactionplan.com or thecopelandcenter.com. So now we're going to look in detail uh, about the contents of a wellness plan and how to devise your own. So these are the questions that I mentioned earlier about thinking about essentially what you're like when you're well, what you're like when you're unwell, things that keep you well, things that make you unwell, uh, communication and support. So first off, let's talk about that baseline. So um, as in medicine, so in life. So often with our patients, um, if you're doctors out there, um, we will do baseline tests that allow us to have an idea of what the patient is like at their best or at the starting point. And that gives us an idea of what we're trying to get them back to. And this is a very similar um, thing as what you're trying to do with the wellness plan. So you need to establish your own baseline before you can know which direction you're heading in. So the first question you need to ask yourself is what am I like when I'm well? So this can be any number of descriptors. Basically we're looking for adjectives. Are you a calm person? Um, are you a social person? Um, are you adventurous? Are you really passionate about something? Um, are you really creative? So 
It is about thinking about you at your best. And then you need to ask yourself, what do you need to do every day to keep yourself feeling as well as possible? So at my worst, this was really simple things. I realized that just going outside for a walk every day, getting some sunshine, having a healthy meal, getting enough sleep, all those kind of basic things were things that I needed to do every single day and actually things that were pretty achievable. I also had to think about um, what I needed to do less frequently. And that is the other question for establishing your baseline. So um, things that keep you well, but you don't need to do every single day. So these might be things that you want to do every week or every month. Uh, so for me, creativity was really important. So I wanted to spend time trying out new recipes for food. Um, I wanted to make sure I was going to an exhibition every month. Um, these were sort of wider things that weren't everyday things, but were still really important to my sense of identity. And obviously there are always the things that we need to avoid. So late nights, um, going out too much, because that was something that really um, made me feel really, really tired and uh, didn't help me recharge my batteries that much because I'm a bit of an introvert. Um, these are all things that uh, are worth kind of thinking about in the initial setup phases of your wellness plan. And just at the top here, I've put uh, a wandering baseline ECG. <laughs> so um, that's just my little joke of saying, you know, as with ECGs, so in life, sometimes the baseline goes up and down, but at least if you have an idea of what it's supposed to look like, then you know what you need to do to get you back to that point. So um, in trying to think about what keeps you well, if you are feeling relatively stable at the moment, it's actually a really good time to explore other areas that you maybe haven't thought about yet um, that might help you support your wellness. So new activities or things that you haven't tried yet or things that you used to do a long time ago but you haven't done um, for one reason or another, perhaps because um, as with everybody else, you know, over time there's an attrition and those kind of activities that keep you well like we were talking about before. So I use something called the Level 10 Life, and this is adapted from Hal Elrod's book, The Miracle Morning, which you can find at miraclemorning.com. Um, and it is basically a wheel of life. Now, many of you uh, may have seen this before. It often contains eight sections rather than 10. This particular one contains 10. Um, and what it does is it represents all the different areas of your life as the spokes of a wheel. So I've actually adapted the original categories, um, but they will include things like personal development, uh, career or professional development, spirituality or mental health, um, fitness, social relationships, finances, um, fun and recreation, charity, um, and, and basically any areas that are important to you are the ones that you should include in your own level 10 life plan or in your own wheel of life. So originally this was designed as a goal setting tool and as a personal development tool. Um, it's not directly linked to wellness, but I realized that actually for every single one of these areas, there were things that I could do to make myself feel more well. So for example, for mental health hygiene, things for me were things like uh, meditation and journaling and actually therapy when I needed it before. Um, for creativity, it was things like those recipes that I mentioned. Um, and uh, for social, it was things like spending time with friends and talking to them. So if you take each area of life and you look at it, that might give you a bit of inspiration about thinking about how you can be well in each area of your life. Now, as you can see with <laughs> this particular extract. This is from my own diary from when I wasn't uh, very well myself. Um, you start off essentially by marking where you are at the beginning and then try and put a dark line where you started off so that you have somewhere to measure your progress from. And as you can see, I was not doing very well on mental health hygiene or on professional development or on health and fitness. Other areas were slightly better. And then over time, you can go back and look at it every month or whenever you want to and remark it and just see where you're at. And this can be used as a way to help you set goals in terms of your wellness. 
So the next part is looking about when you are less well. So first of all, thinking about triggers. So what your triggers are. So these are things that are either circumstances or events or thoughts that are outside of your control that happen that lead to you feeling unwell. Some of these you will be able to avoid. For example, for me, things like uh, really late nights, not helpful. Um, but some of them you just have to learn to cope with because they're outside of your realm of influence. For example, one of my triggers is actually change, which is really unfortunate because change is really common uh, in life and unavoidable. And in that particular situation, I had to develop coping strategies and some ways to get inspiration about uh, how you might be able to better cope with these triggers um, is asking yourself the question, what do I do to help myself feel better during or after a rough day? Sometimes it can also help to think about what someone else would do for you. Um, so it can be really helpful to um, imagine what you would want to have someone do for you. Um, and this could be things like, you know, just cutting you some slack um, or being kind to yourself. Um, or it might be more uh, practical things like ways to relax at home. Now, sometimes despite our best efforts, uh, we do start to feel less well. And um, when this happens, uh, there tend to be warning signs. So what I've included here is actually an early warning score um, graph where basically this is what we use in hospital to uh, monitor patients' physical condition and see if they're getting better, if they're getting worse, or if they're stable. And it measures things like heart rate and blood pressure and respiratory rates, as I'm sure any doctors who are listening will know. Um, but as in medicine, again, so in life, uh, when we are less well, uh, mentally, physically, emotionally, there are usually warning signs. And these are different for every single person. And they might be behaviors that we exhibit. They might be feelings that we have or thoughts that we have. And it's worth spending some time thinking about those. So for me, I noticed that when I was less well, I would start to withdraw socially. Um, I would start to go to bed really late and wake up really late. I would binge eat um, and I just feel intense anxiety. And Oftentimes, the first thing that would happen for me was actually that I would start binge watching TV. Um, so eventually, I realized that these were things that, um, for me, were signs that I was going downhill. And having an idea of what those things are for you will help you to notice what's happening earlier and put things in place and start to activate those wellness tools that you've already thought about from before um, that will help you start to be on an upward trend and start to feel better again. So we've talked about recognizing the warning signs and how important that is in order to prevent that kind of downward um, slope. Um, and now how do you actually monitor your wellness so that you can recognize them? Because as we said before, most of us are really, really busy. There's not usually enough time to kind of sit and think actively about our wellness. Um, so how do we notice this when it's actually happening? Well, there are different ways um, and there are different tools that you can use. One of the tools that I uh, really like using is something called a mood tracker. Um, so this one is a paper version that I designed when I was feeling uh, quite unwell um, back in 2017. And essentially each box uh, represents a day of the year. And you can uh, think about different moods like happy, sad, desperately sad, anxious, angry, whatever it is for you. And you can color code them and use um, each square to represent how you're feeling. Now, as you can see, I didn't have very good staying power with this one as I did not complete it. Um, but it was um, a really good way to um, keep on track of things um, and 
to monitor um, how I was actually feeling. So I found that actually trying to think about how I felt emotionally that day was a good uh, way to start thinking about that day itself and what had happened and trying to kind of look at it. Um, although sometimes I wouldn't even journal about it. It was just a way to actually recognize how I was feeling because I was so busy that I often did not have the time to stop and think. Um, and actually, it's pretty common for doctors to use uh, emotional or psychological techniques like suppression and repression. So suppression is where you kind of push down your emotions until a time when you can actually deal with them. And repression is where you just kind of try and push down those feelings and hope that they disappear. And these are quite adaptive techniques for us doctors. I mean, if if every sort of medical emergency at work made us spiral out of control, that wouldn't do. Um, so we use these techniques quite commonly. But what it can do is it can lead to a place where we actually find it hard to recognize our own emotions when they're happening because um, we're just too busy with things. Other than a paper version, there are many apps that you can actually use to monitor your mood. Uh, so I currently use this one. Um, this is from an app called Dailyo, D-A-Y-L-I-O. And yeah, it's basically a mood diary. It allows you to kind of select, pre-select the moods and then allocate a different color scheme for them. You don't have to use the muted colors that I've used here, um, but uh, you can end up having this kind of checkerboard kind of image of your year and your emotions on each day. What it also allows you to do, which I really like, um, is it allows you to link up different activities to the mood of that day <laughs> and it actually gives you data about like uh whether those things make you feel better or worse and it can be quite surprising actually what um what things make you feel really well so for me having coffee apparently and sometimes going out uh can be really helpful and staying out later than i had intended um but within reason, obviously. And um, this is not me promoting this app. This is a free app. This is just the one that I like to use. Another thing that I use is an app called Streaks. And this is kind of the flip side. This is not necessarily thinking about mood per se, but it's about monitoring those activities that do keep you well. And um, when you're doing less of those, that might be an indication that perhaps you're pulling back from your wellness and perhaps you're doing that because you don't feel well, which is often the case. Um, so this is just a screenshot from an app called Streaks, uh, which I use. And as you can see, I've got waking up early, going to bed on time, or waking up by a certain time, <laughs> not exactly early, um, going to bed on time, uh, reading, exercising, doing yoga, and then other types of exercise. Um, and what I found this helped me do was it helped me elevate the importance of those activities that were associated with my wellness. So um, they went up to being like on my to-do list. So far more important than I would normally have given them credit for. And again, um, you know, you can kind of have a look at um, how you're doing with keeping up with those activities. And if you're falling behind on them, that could indicate that you're not necessarily um, paying enough attention to your wellness. So the next part um, is thinking about having an action plan or a crisis plan. So sometimes despite our best efforts, despite monitoring, despite knowing what keeps us well, things will happen in life and we will not be so well. And here I put this little meme of the dog who's in the burning room and saying, you know, this is fine. Don't do that. Um, <laughs> obviously, once you've recognized that things are not going so well, it's time to put in place an action plan or activate an action plan on how to keep yourself well in order to get better. So it can be really helpful to have this in advance. Um, as I said before, most of us do not think in concrete terms about our wellness until something goes wrong. The problem with that is that obviously you get a lot worse before you start to get better and you're not prepared for it. And the truth is that at some point in our lives, all of us will experience being in that burning room, being in that place where it's just things are not going well. And it's great to have something in advance that you can fall back on when that happens. Um, so I did this when I was struggling with work and I actually made myself a little checklist, which I had on my phone. So when things were getting too much, I would rest. I would put away my to-do list. 
And I would actually do something that I called active rest, which is a way that I tried to conceptualize rest um, as something productive, which it can be. Um, sometimes it can be better to pull back and, and take that break. But I wouldn't allow myself to kind of vegetate and just stay at home and feel sorry for myself. Active rest involved for me things like going out and seeing friends, going out and doing some kind of well-being activity outside of the house to get myself outside, um, which was one of the things that keeps me well and kind of moving my body. Um, and you'll have to think about yourself in the situation and balancing doing the activities that keep you well whilst exercising self-compassion. So it's no good to write in your action plan, uh, oh yeah, I need to do loads of exercise today, even though I'm really not motivated to do it. Um, and then kind of feeling really unhappy because you're trying to force yourself to do something. But it's a balance between self-compassion and, and self-discipline to get you to a place where you feel well enough without forcing yourself to do things. And another part of this is thinking about how can you get help? So um, sometimes when things are going really bad, uh, it can be helpful to get someone else to take some of your responsibilities off your shoulders. So thinking in advance about who can help you with that and what they can help you with is really important. Uh, so it might be things like asking for help with childcare from a relative or asking your partner to maybe um, do some of the more things at home or asking somebody that you live with, that you share a house with, if they can do some of the cleaning. And then there's other types of help as well. So perhaps you have a mentor or a coach or perhaps you are think, thinking about getting a therapist. All those things can be really helpful to give you somebody that you can discuss the situation with. And that's the way that those people can help. And just on the point of communicating your needs, I believe that a lot of doctors struggle to be vulnerable with each other, but also with other people in their lives. And my mantra is that sometimes being strong means knowing when you need help and being brave enough to ask for it. And there are different ways to ask for it. So when I was really unwell, I really struggled with motivation, as well as with being vulnerable with somebody. And I, I found it really hard to explain that I wasn't well and what I needed from them. So it helps to do that kind of thing in advance. So what I actually did was I took my early warning signs and I made a list of them and I shared them with people I was really, really close with. So um, really close with friends and family members. Um, and I told them, you know, this is what I start to do when I'm unwell. If you see this happening, this is what I want you to do. And just kind of having that contract with them that if you started to get to that point, they would either know how to help support me, for example, with responsibilities, or they would know what I wanted them to help me do, for example, um, going to see my GP, you know. And then you've got to think about how you communicate that when it's happening. So I actually um, devised a system where I picked a emoji that I did not use very much, and I dedicated that to be the emoji that meant I'm not very well. So when things were not great and I wasn't motivated enough and I did not have the energy to explain what was going on, I would just send um, that single emoji and that single emoji would communicate to that person that they needed to activate the, the crisis plan. And those are all the components of designing your own wellness plan. So um, hopefully I've shown you that it is not rocket science. Far from that, it is a framework and a reflect tool that you can use to support your own wellness, both planning ahead for it and monitoring it and having something to fall back on when things are not going so well. So I hope you enjoyed that talk. Big thanks to the RMBF for organizing this event. If you have any questions, you can find me on social media at the well underscore doctor. And you can also reach me through my website, www.thewelldoctor.org. Uh, and I believe if you have any questions, the RMBF would also be happy to forward those to me. Thanks for listening.